Welcome to Intuitive Transformations with your host, Sylvia Henderson, and discover tools, wisdom, and inspiration that will empower you to transform your life. Sylvia is an intuitive life coach and energy healer with a growing practice that is focused on empowering others to be more of who they want to be. For the next hour, join Sylvia and explore and unravel anything in the way of you creating the life that you would love to live on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Hello and welcome to the Intuitive Transformations radio show where you will find tools you can use to change and transform your life right here on the Voice of Consciousness, the Ohm Times radio network at ohmtimes.com. I'm Sylvia Henderson, your host, and I am an intuitive and an energy healer located in Kirkland, Washington, just a few minutes away from Seattle, Washington. And if you would like to learn more about me and the work that I do, please feel free to visit my website at intuitivetransformations.net. Again, that's intuitive transformations with an S dot net. Now, I'm pretty certain that just about everyone with access to any kind of a news feed is beginning to realize that it's becoming increasingly impossible to avoid noticing the extremely disturbing events that are going on in our world today. And these events are very confusing, which makes them even more stressful because they are difficult to rationalize and to understand. My guest today will probably explain this much better than I can, but there is something primal within us all that makes us instantly afraid of what we cannot understand. And there is so much that is going on in the world today that we cannot understand and that it is literally stressing us out beyond what we've experienced before. And this is not just happening here in the United States because the insanity of anger Hatred and fear is happening on a a very grand global scale. I can't keep track personally of all the terrorist attacks. They just seem to be coming one right after the other as of late. And I can't keep track of the hate mongering and I can't keep track of the senseless shootings and the violence that all of us, if not actually visually being, um, Uh, aware of, we at least know that they've been happening. We have a real problem that transcends whose life matters at this point. Now, I could be wrong, but I believe that what is going on is that we have a chronic epidemic of PTSD, or at least a chronic epidemic of fight, flight, freeze response, that everyone is overwhelmed, overtaxed, and not able to negotiate and be present with their lives because of one trauma after the other being uh, presented to us. We really are living in truly extremely interesting times. Today we live in an information-focused society that lives with technology that instantly connects us to every event that is happening around the world as it happens. And instead of watching cute little puppies at play or laughing along with adorable toddlers on Facebook, we are basically being traumatized by images that are so assaultive and beyond our conscious reasoning of what is logic that it's throwing us into trauma with little or no warning. So what does this all really mean? Well, If you've been listening to my show at all, you know that I believe that in spite of what we're seeing out in the world today, we are actually moving toward the higher vibration of unconditional love and and compassion for each other because the light of unconditional non-judgmental love, which is illuminating and exposing everything that is not like itself. So in truth, what I see here is an opportunity for us, humankind, mankind, to actually heal and transform this rage and anger and hatred that we have used against ourselves and against others. You can't heal what you don't know is there. 
And right now what is happening is that it's so in our face that we have to confront it. We have to address it. We have to change it and we have to heal it. Now, as we are, you know, I guess some people might be thinking, you know, are we beginning to see the dark side of mankind's consciousness being played out in the world today? And I have to say, yeah, in a way we are. It's like the shadow of mankind is being exposed on a very grand level because this is what's being held in the collective mind. But I also believe with all of my heart that we will transcend this because we do have the capacity within us in humanity, mankind does, to heal and to forgive and to mend. And as we wake up to our important compassionate work ahead of us of healing our inner wounds that are at the root of all the anger and the hatred and the fear, this too shall pass. So I want to encourage everyone listening as we move forward throughout the rest of the year, because, you know, we've got this whole election coming up and there's so many things that are still unresolved and in the air and there's things I just was looking on Facebook and something just recently happened in Munich and I'm like, something else? Oh my goodness. But I want to encourage everyone, instead of getting caught up in that, to focus your energies on getting to the other side of any anger, of any fear, or any rage that you may be holding within yourself. Because it always starts with us first, as individuals, before we can begin to heal others. Focus on offering compassion to yourself and for whatever you consider to be your own personal shortcomings comings or however that critical voice wants to malign you with, begin to have compassion for yourself. Focus on act, on doing that so that you can offer compassion to others and then also focus on offering compassion to our planet. So what can you do when you are stressed out by what is going on in the world today or even within your own private and personal life in the meantime? Today I have Dr. Arthur P. Sarah McCauley joining me to talk about his brand new book, The Stress Solution, Using Empathy and Cognitive Behavior Therapy to Reduce Anxiety and Develop Resilience. And trust me when I tell you all that this book will help you answer that question and so much more. Now, Arthur P. Sarah McCauley um, has an EDD and a PhD, and he is a licensed clinical psychologist and the chief medical officer of soundminds.org. It's a mental health platform with 42,000 registered users and an annualized download rate of 150,000 for the three apps that he developed. Dr. Sierra McCauley has been on the faculty of Harvard Medical School and a lecturer for the American Cancer Society. He is the author of a number of books, including the book that we're going to talk about, The Stress Solution, as well as The Curse of the Capable, The Hidden Challenges to a Balanced, Healthy, High-Achieving Life, Performance Addiction, The Dangerous New Syndrome and How to Stop It from Ruining Your Life, and The Power of Empathy, A Practical Guide to Creating Intimacy, Self-Understanding, and Lasting Love, which is now published in seven languages. He has appeared on CNN, Fox News Boston, Good Morning America Weekend, The O'Reilly Report, and other shows. He has been a weekly radio guest on Your Healthy Family on Sirius Satellite Radio and Holistic Health Today, and has been interviewed on numerous other radio programs airing on NPR, XM Radio, and AM and FM stations. Dr. Arthur Sear McCauley lives in a suburb of Boston with his wife and two daughters, and he's joining us here today. Welcome to the show, Dr. Arthur Sierra McCauley, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia. I enjoyed listening to you because I think we're kindred spirits, and I, I think the concern you have about our society and our world is certainly my concern as well and has a lot to do with why I wrote this book because I'm so concerned about what's happening throughout the world and particularly what stress is doing to our health and and how we perceive other people and, and situations, you know. 75% of Americans today are saying that they suffer from physical or emotional stress daily, and 50% of Americans say they wake up every night due to stress. And 75% of visits to primary care physicians last year was caused by stress. So stress rates are certainly exa- accentuating in our society, and 
I wanted to write a book to specifically address this epidemic because it's 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 rising and people are suffering more and more and the the stress hormones that are produced by stress we can talk about at length throughout the interview but they really uh, cause many damaging effects you know they they really do and I tell you your book the timing is so perfect. <laughs> I don't even know if you knew at the time that it was going to release that we were going to be in this political mud fight that we're in and the hate mongering. And then I tell you, one horrific event after the other, it seems like they're coming almost every other day or every, you know, it used to be once a month or every other month. And now it's, yes. it's yes. like, you know, another one. Are you serious? Are you kidding me? And the stress is, was palpable prior to this. People were our, yes. these statistics that you're giving were before this year. Yes, yes. right. They were before this year, but it's 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 becoming worse. And I agree with you. I mean, I, you just mentioned what happened in Germany, and I just got an alert on my phone uh, again. And I think people are becoming more and more fearful, and we're also becoming somewhat desensitized to it because yeah. it does appear like it's happening every other day. And that. That's why, you know, I wrote a chapter, as you know, on prejudice in the book, and I think stress and prejudice are intimately related, and that's why I was so glad that my publisher, you know, I begged to be able to write that chapter because I think people don't realize that, that being able to perceive accurately is crucial to reducing stress, and all biased thinking based on early conditioning distorts reality and causes unnecessary tension. And Whenever you encounter someone you have an inherent prejudice against, whether it's conscious or unconscious, you begin to experience a degree of stress. And when we're stressed, we release the stress hormone cortisol, which limits our capacity for empathy, which is extremely important. Yeah. So it limits our capacity for empathy, and it makes us have repetitive, narrow thinking. And if you have prejudice it does. Against, against several types of people, it's likely that your cortisol levels will be consistently high. Dr. Ceremony, can you, Sarah Zerigoli, can you hold that thought for just a minute? We'll return after the sure. break and we'll continue this conversation. Thank you. The future of Internet radio is here. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Miriam Knight of New Consciousness Review, inviting you to my new show where I interview the rising stars of the conscious awakening. We'll explore the many faces of consciousness in action and intriguing perspectives on life, the universe, and everything in between. Join us each Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern on the Rising Stars Show. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Hello and welcome back, everyone. This is Sylvia Henderson on the Intuitive Transformations radio show on OMTimes.com. And I have with me today my special guest, Dr. Arthur Sierra McCauley. And he is the author of The Stress Solution Using Empathy and Cognitive Behavior Therapy to Reduce Anxiety and Develop Resilience. And before we went to the break, Dr. C was talking about his chapter in his book where he's addressing the issue of prejudice. And what I want people to know is that prejudice is not about race. It is prejudgment. That is what prejudice is. It's You've already judged something 
prior to really, you know, understanding it for yourself. So, Dr. C, can you talk a little bit about that and how that creates stress within us? And also, I, you know, maybe talk a little bit about what we can do to combat that. Sure. Um, you know, well, so the, the, the issue is that when we react quickly, we're, using, we're usually reacting from conditioning. What we believed that we were taught early in life or the ideas or images that our parents or those people that are important to us had of other people. And that these, these ideas that we have really haven't been examined very thoroughly to find out what the truth is. You know, I, I tell people that, you know, early in life we create a novel, a fictitious story about ourselves that we write based on what we think is being reflected back to us from those around us, as if we're looking at ourselves in a, in a circus mirror. If the mirrors you're, but if the mirrors you're looking into are cracked or inaccurate, you get a distorted view of yourself and of other people as if you're looking in a circus mirror. So as a result, you can, you can create an accurate story about yourself and other people, and it sets, sets the stage for an irrational belief system. And I think as adults, our, our, our responsibility is to examine the things we've learned about ourselves and others to see what the truth is, and that's where empathy comes in. You know, empathy calms the emotional brain so we can perceive accurately and thoughtfully. It slows down the process so that we can really read in beyond the surface, beyond the, the surface of what we see in another person into their heart and soul. And, and rather than making judgments, as you said, quickly based on old conditioning, empathy slows down our process so that we can see the truth, not only about other people but about ourselves. And ironically, when we, when we give and receive empathy, it produces the, the neurotransmitter, the near magical neurotransmitter, oxytocin. And oxytocin is the opposite of the stress hormone cortisol. In fact, it limits cortisol levels. It helps us live longer. It aids in recovery from illness and injury. It promotes a sense of calm and well-being. And it increases empathy and generosity. It protects against heart disease. It, it decreases inflammation. Most importantly, it reduces craving for addictive substances. It creates bonding trust in other people, which we don't have right now, it decreases fear, and it creates a feeling of security, and it opens us up to love other people who may not look similar to us on the surface, but when we use empathy, we see people beyond the surface, and, and then we realize that most human beings, we're more alike beyond the surface than we are not alike. We may be different color, we may be, have a different religion, we may be, come from a different country, but if you know how to give and receive empathy, if you're in relationships where you give and receive empathy, transformation occurs, and we produce the opposite of what we produce when we're stressed and have biased thinking, which is the stress hormone cortisol, which not only causes negative thinking, but it causes weight gain, inflammation, hair loss, breaks down muscle tissue, causes flabbiness, depression, anxiety, and it literally kills neurons in the memory center of the brain. So it's very destructive. On the other hand, when we have empathic interchange, when we know how to listen to someone empathically, that's why I wrote a chapter in the book, as you know, on empathic listening, that when we're able to do that, when we're able to really listen and be present, as you indicated earlier, we change neurochemically. We change our own neurochemistry neurochem naturally. And we widen our ability to see, to see all the variables in the situation. When we're stressed, our view, it's like when we're stressed, we take a wide-end lens camera and we make it a very narrow lens camera. When we have empathy mm -hmm. for each other, we expand our view of other people and we see into their heart and soul with what we need to do to make connections, what we need to do to sustain our spirit and to make us go into the world and, and be more resilient. That is so powerful because to me, when I think of how you're describing empathy, it allows you to remain curious in the moment because once we create a judgment, that's when we create something as right versus wrong. Yes, we create right, wrong, good, bad, and there's no gray. And then we, we mm -hmm. use a lot of cognitive distortions, and that's why I focus, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy basically focuses on distorted ways of thinking like black and white thinking, generalizing, magnifying, catastrophizing, minimizing, projecting. They're all ways that we distort reality. That's why I combine empathy with cognitive behavioral therapy so that people can slow down 
and do the exercises in the book. You know, this really is more of a workbook, and I, and I encourage people to go through it slowly, not go through it quickly, so that you do the exercises. And I ask people at the end of each chapter to take action because I believe that change is an active process, and I ask them to confide in someone that's close to them what they're learning and to get feedback from the other person because we don't change alone. We're too subjective. We repeat the same kind mm -hmm. of thinking that we've had all our lives. We need to be open enough, vulnerable enough, giving enough so that we can hear and take in and give feedback, and that's where we learn. We change and grow in relationships, not in isolation. I completely agree. I mean, I think that this book, the way you've written it and with the exercises and taking action, this is a great book for a study, a book club to read together, a meetup group to create a study with this. This is how we change our world is by changing it from the inside out. So, Dr. C., can you talk a little bit about what cognitive behavior therapy is, CBT. You know, I have two sons with autism, and I'm familiar with applied behavior analysis, where uh, how you look at the behavior and you try to figure out what was the um, antecedent, what created the behavior, what was the reward of the behavior, and then how do you redirect the behavior. But what is cognitive behavior therapy? Well, cognitive behavioral therapy is basically a therapy that's focused exclusively on the present. They don't go into the past. And it basically is focused on, on where we distort how we perceive. And as I, I mentioned, we, there's a whole glossary in the beginning of the book of all the, the ways we do distort reality, like, like, for instance, generalizing and magnifying and catastrophizing. Why I added mm -hmm. empathy is I don't believe cognitive behavioral therapy in and of itself is enough. I think we have to understand mm -hmm. where we learn these biases. I don't think it's, a, it's not good enough for me to just say, oh, you know, uh, you think Polish people are not intelligent. Um, uh, gee, you know, that's not true. We need to correct that distortion. We need to find out how you learned that in the first place. Where did it come from? So once you understand the myth of it and how you may have learned it from an inaccurate source, it makes it much easier to unlearn it. You know, anything we've learned, we can unlearn. And prejudice is, is learned, and not only about other people, but about ourselves. You know, that's where mm -hmm. self-talk comes in. I mean, so many, so many people have a critical inner voice which causes stress because they internalize stress, you know, and they blame themselves for situations that are often out of their control. And, and they, they have difficulty separating what, what a particular event when it is, is situational or it's personal. You know, so they've already developed negative thoughts about the stress they may, they may be encountered before it actually exists. And this internal neg negativity makes you far more likely to overreact to a stressful situation. But so you have to unlearn, unlearn how did you become negative about yourself? Because if you're not at ease with yourself, if you, if you can't live within your own skin with, with some kind of serenity and calm, it's very hard to perceive other people accurately because normally you're so self-conscious about what people are going to think of you. And, you know, when you're so worried about what people are going to think of you, you can't properly assess other people. It's why I think people make grand mistakes in marriages all the time, you know, because they're, they're just looking for somebody to love them because they don't love themselves. So the first person yep. that comes along and shows them some attention, there's no, there's no assessment of the other person at all. It's, he really likes me. She really likes me. Well, okay, but does that mean that you're going to have a long-lasting, intimate relationship just because somebody sees I'm you in a positive way? I so agree with you. <laughs> I mean, I really just so agree with you. You're so dead on. We don't even know who we are, and yet we're inviting someone else to the party as if they their presence will give us permission to know who we are and to love who we are, and that's not how it works at all. No, it's not how it works because when we're not aware of our longing and how our longing sort of blinds us to the person in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let me ask you this. You, you've already spoken about how cortisol creates havoc in our body because we're we are getting too much of it. I mean, it, it has a health. It's a healthy response when it's done, you know, when we're responding to a bear in the woods or, um, you know, but now there's a bear everywhere. There's a bear in traffic. There's a bear when you get an email. There's a bear when the phone rings, when the baby cries, when you get a bill and you open it. And so and then if you turn on the news, oh, my God. So how does empathic CBT um, change the neurochemistry of the brain 
you know, does it, it turns off the cortisol? Does it calm down the amygdala? Because I know that's where the fight and flight and freeze response happens. Yes, 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 it, it does. It does, Sylvia, calm down the amygdala. It calms down the emotional part of the brain, and it helps us use, utilize the thinking part of the brain. When we react more slowly and thoughtfully, and that's what empathy is. You know, empathy is the capacity to understand and respond to the unique experiences of another. And in order to do that, you have to employ empathic listening. And empathic listening means that you kind of know how to listen to another person's soul in a, to a position of discovery and disclosure. You, you, you provide such a safe environment that people want to talk to you. They want to be genuine and authentic with you. And when we do that, we produce oxytocin and other calming neurochemicals that make us feel secure. And they lessen the stress response and they expand our empathy. When we're stressed, our empathy becomes very limited. That's why in this environment that you were talking about at the beginning of the show, in this environment, this very, um, you know, with, with our political climate, with presidential candidates' emphasis on aggression, insults, lying, and lack of integrity, you know, it's, it's symbolic of the, of, of the lack of importance of character and empathy. And it's currently dominating our, our scene. And it dominates, all, you know, the, the corporate world as well very often. And it influences our society. So we're, we're in this world where we're being told not to like this group and that group is bad rather than slowing down and really realizing that one person, one hateful person can destroy 300 good people. That doesn't mm. mean all people are bad. It means one individual. And many of these individuals are people who have been struggling, who have mental illness or have been in an impoverished way or don't have positive relationships. They don't have a family. And it's just like the old gangs of the 70s and 60s. You know, it's, very, it's just like white supremacists. I mean, it's very easy to attract people that are lost and looking for something to belong to. People are looking for an ex, uh, someone to blame for their problems. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to Intuitive Transformations Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be back after the break. The cutting edge of conscious radio. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. As difficult as it is to believe, there are places in Africa where human traffickers sell albino children and their body parts for use in magic rituals. Humanity Healing International is actively working in Uganda to change this paradigm. The Albino Rescue Project finds albino children who are at risk and places them in safe schools and environments where they can learn and grow free from fear. To learn more or to sponsor a child, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to in your busy world how do you improve yourself and keep your life going i'm lisa k and my between heaven and earth radio show can transform your life just by listening be uplifted with inspiring topics positive stories and ideas that really work between heaven and earth radio is conscious living for your soul every wednesday at 4 p.m eastern time Hi, I'm Jimmy Buffett. How would you like to meet an endangered manatee? You can by joining Save the Manatee Club's Adopt the Manatee program. You can't take them home, but you can get to know your new manatee friend through the photo, biography, and information the club sends to you. And you can read updates on your manatee in the club newsletter. More importantly, your contribution goes to programs that are working to save manatees from extinction. It's easy to help. Call 1-800-432-JOIN. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Intuitive Transformations Radio, and this is Sylvia Henderson with my guest, Dr. Arthur Sir McCauley. We're talking about his new book, The Stress 
solution. And Dr. Sear McCauley, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your mother because you talk about her in the book and how she was a really wonderful teacher for you when it came to understanding empathy and uh, human behavior as well. And you shared a story in the book that about how your mother used your grandfather's funeral to teach you a lesson in psychology. Would you mind sharing that story sure. with those who are listening? That'd sure, be great. I'd be glad to, Sylvia. It, you know, when I, when I was uh, an undergraduate and I changed my major to psychology, um, my grandfather, my mother's father, passed away. And uh, I came home for the wake and funeral. And in those days, you know, there were two days of wakes, afternoon and evening, afternoon and evening, and then a funeral. So it was a very long process. And my mother uh, sort of took me in a room uh, alone and asked me about my major. You know, I had changed my major to psychology. And she said, uh, well, what is psychology? And I said, it's the study of, of human nature. And she said, well, you're going to learn more in the next three days that you can ever learn from a book. And my mother only went to the seventh grade. And then her father made her go to work because he didn't think girls needed to be educated, even even to go to high school. So my mother said to me, um, what do you think of your grandfather? And I said, well, you know, I, I don't really know him very well. All I know is he's very wealthy, has a lot of businesses. He always has new cars and new suits. And um, and I, I sort of had an idea that he had affairs, but I found out later that he did. And um, actually, my grandmother passed away. She died of a heart attack when she found a letter in his jacket that um, was from his, his mistress. And uh, my mother always said that she died of a broken heart. And of course, I being a smart undergraduate said, that's not possible. Mom, you can't just die of a broken heart. And of course, years later, we learned that there's this thing called broken heart syndrome, where when you are mm -hmm. so traumatized by loss, the left ventricle of the heart swells with cortisol and so and stress hormone, and it actually explodes. And it's very common among uh, women in their early 50s who are menopausal was exactly what where my grandmother was. So my, again, back to the issue of my mother trying to teach me something. She said, so what do you think of him? I said, Mom, that's all I know about him. And she said, well, I want you to do, do me one favor for the next three days. Your grandfather said that he had many, many, many friends, and they were all business friends. And she said, there's going to be loads of people coming to these to the wake on two days and the funeral, but I want you to count how many tears are shed. And I said, Mom, she goes, no, don't, don't question me. That's all I'm asking you to do, and you're going to learn a lot about human beings. So the first day of the afternoon, I'm watching all these people come in, and no one's crying. And then I watch them at night, and no one's crying. Next day, same thing. The funeral, same thing. And hundreds of people. So after everyone left my, my parents' home, because she had everybody back, you know, after the funeral, and it was later in the evening, she sat down with me, and we had coffee, and she said, so, how many tears did you count? And I said, Mom, it's unbelievable. I didn't count one tear. She said, well, now you know. Now you can ask yourself, what kind of man do you want to be? And it was mm. that at that moment that I realized it, it was much more important to be a human being that's giving and, and explores and expresses the goodness within you than someone who is just attaining and achieving. And that's why, you know, I have a chapter in the book called Performance Addiction, which is the belief that perfecting appearance and achieving status will secure love and respect. Because we're, we're such a material society right now, and we're so extremely focused on appearance. And so many people, so many young people believe that's the way to gain love and respect, and they don't even know that that's what they're chasing. And, of course, mm. that was my mother's lesson with my grandfather, that he had, he had money, he had fancy suits, he had women. Um, but what did he have? He didn't have one human being who shed a tear when he passed and left this earth, not one, which, which is amazing. You know, it's interesting, too, because later in the book, you, your father pointed out at your mother's funeral, um, it was quite different, wasn't it? Yes, my father, my mother worked as, um, as a receptionist in an emergency room back in those days where you actually, people actually could spend time in a hospital and she, you could have time to talk to them and my mother would take information from them. And when she passed away, my father looked at me because there was every religion and every race represented at my mother's wake, every religion and every race. And he looked at me and he said, my God, this is like the League of Nations. And people were sobbing. I mean, people that I never even knew 
physicians and nurses that, you know, would come to her and talk with her, and because my mother was a great listener. And, at you know, at the end of the book, uh, a chapter on authenticity, and I ask, who who are you? You know, how many people will 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 cry when you leave this earth? How many tears will be shed? What kind of impact will you make? Because you won't make a great impact if you've just earned a lot of money and stepped on a lot of toes to get to the top of the ladder. And I see, you know, I see people from all levels economically. I see people that are very, you know, blue-collar people, and then I see people who are very wealthy because I, I, I've seen media people and professional athletes for years, and they're no, they're no more happy than the people that are in the middle class or below middle class. And, and actually, it's pretty amazing that, you know, UC Berkeley has done studies in the last few years showing that as people climb the ladder, they, as they gain in, in, in money and material possessions, they actually become more unethical, less empathic. They tend to cheat, and they have less less empathy for people below them. And not everyone, but the, the majority of people that they studied who had become quite wealthy, uh, their character had changed significantly. And I think that we're we're at a time in our society where we have less trust of each other. Our empathy for each other has decreased markedly. Prejudice has gone up. Americans have fewer friends today than they had 10 and 15 years ago. And what's missing? We don't know how to connect. We don't listen to each other mm -hmm. enough. We don't slow down enough so that we can do what, what I'm recommending in this book, give and receive empathy and transform and grow. And we actually change our chemistry. We change our neurochemistry. We don't need a drug. It's a natural way. It's, it's what I call in the book the soul's pharmacy. We, we produce our own natural neurochemistry that enhances our lives, helps us live longer and feel better. So given the, the, the current climate, um, you know, globally, you know, the economic issues, the, the political issues across the board, not just the United States, the violence, the terror, all of that, how do we move forward you know, you spell it out beautifully in your book how we can each individually incorporate these exercises and begin to change one by one, connecting with each other because this this ability for us to connect is really important. And we our technology has um, provided a poor substitution for real human connection. Yeah. So how do we begin to to reconnect at, on a on a broader scale as human beings with one another so that we, I mean, what are some of the first steps we can take? Maybe this is too big of a broad of a question to ask, but, you know, this is something we have to do. Well, I, I think I think it's a very important question, Sylvia, and, I, and I'll try to break it down somewhat, but I, I think we have to try to enter into relationships with all people, not to stay with our little clan. <laughs> not to say with people in our little narrow worlds. We have to not assume things about other people and particularly not assume some of the prejudices and biases and distorted thinking that we learned early in life. We have to unlearn some of that. How do we do that? Well, when you encounter another person, the first, the first step is to ask open-ended questions. You know, this puts pre mm -hmm. preconceptions aside while expressing true in interest in another person's perspective. And instead of asking... Uh, or asking questions where you already give the answer, where you already have a, a, a sense of what you think the person is about. Ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are true inquiries. You know, most questions are statements. It's like um, it, it's like when a, a mother asks a teenage daughter, uh, she has a date and then she comes home and she says, uh, did you really think he was cute? Did you really like him? Well, she's not really asking what the daughter thinks. She's telling the daughter that I don't think he was cute and I didn't really like him. It, you mm -hmm. would open a discussion if you said, gee, how did your date go tonight? How was it? That's an open-ended question. It opens up to the unique experiences of the other person. Closed-ended questions just give people the answer and it creates resistance because people know you're not really listening. You've already concluded. The second step is to slow down. You know, Empathy slows down things so that emotion can be tempered with thoughtful reflection. Listen to how you're speaking. If you're speaking so quickly that you're really not even able to comprehend what another person's saying, try to remember the phrase, slow down. You know, one of my patients, when I meet with uh, she and her husband, she always says, Tom, you're reloading. 
meaning that, you know, while he's speaking, <laughs> while she's speaking, you can see his mouth is open. He can't wait to speak. And then I have to look at him and I say, Tom, what did Edna say? Oh, um, I don't know, something about uh, we're going away. I said, no, no, that's not what she said. You're not really listening. You're you're rehearsing what you're going to say while she's talking. And that that throws empathy to the wind and makes a person feel not understood and not heard. And interestingly, you know, the Harvard Business School did a, a long-term study. Is who's the mo- who are the most successful people in the corporate world? They want to understand why some of their MBA students were not succeeding. After interviewing hundreds of people in hundreds of corporations, what was the answer? These people don't make people understood, and they don't make other people feel heard. The heart and soul mm. of empathy. You know, Stephen mm. Covey was asked years ago, "What's the most important thing for success in the em- in the in the business world?" He gave one answer: empathy. He said, you have to have empathy to wow. negotiate with other people. You know, we, we live in an international world now. My clients travel to China. They, tra- they travel to India. They travel through Europe. Europeans come here. Um, uh, my daughter is, a, is, our daughter is a kindergarten teacher. She has 22 st- students, Sylvia. 11 are from other countries. And you know what the interesting thing is? She says when she sees them in the playground, these little children, they're all hugging each other. The boys have as much empathy as the girls do. They I don't know. They don't notice the color of skin. They don't notice how you dress. They don't notice what kind of food you bring to school. And then she Not says, about gender third, either. It's just that's, about that's the right. love. That's right. And by the third and fourth grade, what is she, she says, I notice the difference. Why? Because they've yeah. been exposed to more conditioning. You know, parents who say, It's yeah, that condition like mindset, mindset that has really created most of the – and people don't even realize. It's like we've been programmed, and they're not even aware that their own belief systems are not their beliefs. That's right, and that's why I emphasize empathy so much because empathy is fact-based. Empathy is truth-based. And that's why I encourage people to do the exercises in the book, read the stories of the people I've interacted with, and and I ask people, you know, who do you identify with? Which kind of distorted thinking do you identify with? How do you unlearn it? Where did you learn it? Because we all have grown up with bias. Everyone has. No one has lived in a perfect environment where everything... No one's immune. (laughs) No one's Exactly. No one is immune. (laughs) Oh, we'll be back in just a minute. We're going into another break. Please stay tuned for more of Intuitive Transformations as we talk about the revolution. Bringing a more conscious lifestyle to your world. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. This is Terry Van Horn, and I want to invite you to join me for my weekly radio show, Hailing Light, on Ohm Times Radio every Wednesday at 6 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. On Healing Light, we want to bring love, light, and blessings into your world. You can find out more about us at www.healinglightonline.com. Blessings. I want to thank my mommy for loving me so much. For taking taking me to the doctor when I broke my foot. For leaving me alone when I wanted to be alone. And And now, now, as a grown-up, I'm thankful for being able to take care of you, my dear mom. For taking you to your therapies. For understanding that sometimes you simply want to be alone. Roles change without us noticing. That's why AARP gives you the information to provide even better care for your loved one. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Well, welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Sylvia Henderson on Intuitive Transformation Radio on OMTimes.com with my very special guest, Dr. Arthur P. Sarah McCauley. And we have been having a wonderful conversation about his brand new book, which I think is a a book that everyone needs to have in their library. It needs to be in every school, every doctor's office, every therapist's office. Um, 
everyone needs to read this book. Everyone on the political campaign trail, every senator, every congressperson, please, because he has in this book some amazing tools that, you know, that work, that will actually help you to heal on so many levels from stress and even the addiction to stress, because I think that that's a problem too, Dr. C. Um, but, you know, before we continue the conversation, can you please tell everyone, you know, your website and how they get can get in touch with you? My website, Sylvia, is balanceyoursuccess.com. Great. And that's the best way for them to get you? Yeah, that would be the best way. And uh, there's my my you can write a note to me at the on the site and it will go directly to my email but also my writings are there blogs and and the different books that i've written as well and i write ongoing uh, blogs you know week to week wonderful 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 so gosh we've touched on so many aspects that are found within this book i love that we've even touched on the issue of perfectionism because you're right the the, it's not just the younger people, though. The other older people as well, they're still kind of stuck in that perfectionism loop of wanting to appear as if there is nothing wrong. And and really what I love, too, is how you talk about authenticity in your book and how important that is. Yeah. And why is that important, be, um, Dr. C., in terms of helping us to reduce our stress? Because, Sylvia, when we substitute our a natural personality for one that's trying to please to gain acceptance and love, it's a failing proposition because pretense is a burden that's depleting and it also makes it difficult to maintain intimacy as, as, and closeness to others because it's, it's, it's closeness really and intimacy, true intimacy, is based on being able to be open, genuine, and vulnerable. You know, authenticity attracts others in powerful ways and allows us to feel comfortable in our own skin. And authentic relating enlivens the spirit and gives us the energy and confidence to go into the world, tolerate stress, and maintain resilience so that we can come home with our self-respect and integrity intact. And, you know, when we're, when, we're, when we're not really revealing ourselves, even if we win other people over, we don't feel comfortable because we know we're, re- we're really not letting them know us. So we're, We feel we're like fraud, certain. don't we? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a fraudulent sense because... You know, you may like me because I'm I'm kind of telling you what I think you want to hear, and maybe I've become good at that. But in my own mind, I know I'm not being myself. I know I'm mm-hmm. not revealing what I think and feel. I may not even be revealing mm-hmm. what I think and feel about you. So that my my main emphasis, it gets back to love relationships that we were talking about early. My main emphasis is to win people over. But when you're just doing that, when you're when you're sacrificing your your authenticity, you are in a state of stress. Because you can't be comfortable. You're always afraid people are going to find out who you really are. You know, in my group sessions, people will eventually reveal certain things about themselves that they've held, you know, for so long, the secret, these secrets that we carry, thinking that people are going to reject them. And, it, and it's, you know, in 25 years of doing group therapy, I mean, it's never been true. We had a woman a, a couple of weeks ago for three or four weeks. She said, oh, there's something I want to tell you, but I'm not uncomfortable. Finally, she says, well, my father's an alcoholic. And one of the guys looked at her and he said, oh, you only got one parent that's an alcoholic? Both my parents are alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and other people said, well, you're not responsible for your father. And, and you know, and then another person said, well, you know, I, I always thought everybody was looking at me because I don't have my hair. I'm, I've been bald, you know, uh, for so many years. And I feel so, and, and people looked at me and said, you know, Sam, we, I never even thought of your hair or not hair. And somebody else said, well, I think people focus on my weight in here. And then, you know, the group as a whole let her know that we really have been focusing on you, not your weight. Um, But, you know, we have all these sensitivities. If we don't talk about them and we don't find out what the truth is, we we live our lives as if we know the truth. You know, our truth is, is reality. And we won't give up our story. And that's why, I, as I was saying earlier, we wrote a novel in life. It's a fictionally account of ourselves. We have to make it a nonfiction account. And how can you do that if you stick to your own story? And you won't take in But it's back so challenging. You know, it's so challenging because, and I see this all the time when I work with clients, and even in my own life in order to move forward and do some of the things I've done is those stories come from what we heard as children, those little sideways comments 
that we incorporated or, you know, not getting the approval that we needed at the time, the nurturing that we needed. As children, you discern that it must be something about yourself. And then we make up a story as to, well, it must be because that one time they made a comment about my hair. And so therefore my hair must be the issue in other issue it's situations. So it's, it's a very, it's a big ball of yarn that we're unwinding here. It, it, it is Sylvia. I, I entirely agree with you, but one thing I know for sure, anything that's learned can be unlearned. If you're going to spend agree. time on this earth, you might, might as well spend it trying to find out the truth about yourself and other people. We're here anyway. I agree. You know, I, I have mm-hmm. relatives who said, well, I wish I had explored some of this 10 years ago. I said, yeah, you'd be 10 years ahead if you had. But, you know, you're, you're <laughs> closed-minded. You don't want to look into anything. So now we're 10 years later and we're still having the same conversation. Yeah. So yeah. It, it can happen. Does it happen easily? No. Anybody who's telling you that these kind of changes happen easily, no. But, you know, you've done it. I, look, I was a kid who did a postgraduate year of high school. My guidance counselor told me, you know, I wasn't college material. He gave me five brochures to the Army, Navy, Marines, and and National and Coast Guard, and told me to, you know, kids like me don't go to college. I mean, it, you know, mm-hmm. I had a, I skipped school. I had to repeat my senior year of high school, and here I am talking to you. I mean, yeah. a lot of years later, but but it with happened. two doctorates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With <laughs> with two doctorates underneath your belt, so. Um, we only have, um, what, six minutes left in the show. Can you talk a little bit about the image love? Well, image love is a product of performance addiction, like what, what I mentioned before, that you know, empathy is the heart of relationship skills, and that's what, what performance addicts need to learn because they really are falling in love with images. And you know, mm. when, you fall, when, when you fall in love with an image, you're falling in love with a resume. You know, I give you an example of two clients of mine. They moved here from California, and and she's a bit significantly younger than him. He was a CFO. She was an intern. He hired her. Long story short, she they married. She thought he was wonderful. He he got he got laid off, and he came to Massachusetts because he he was going to be employed by a startup for a new product. And long story short, the, the product didn't work, and he's he's without a job again. And she came into a meeting and she said to me, I just don't feel the same about him. I said, why is that? She said, well, when I come home, he's in his sweatpants all, all, all night long looking for jobs on the Internet. And I said, well, how does that change your love for him? She said, well, I used to see him in his suits and he looked so handsome and he was giving mm. these talks in our staff meeting. That's image love. Did she ever it's really love him? It's a superficial love. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's, she liked the him. she yeah. liked the surface image of him. Yeah. Yeah. So, she liked the um, that's, yes, exactly. And that happens quite a bit, you know, when, um, you know, that, well, not all the time, but it, you know, it does happen in relationships when someone, or even friendships, you know, when someone gets a divorce and then some friendships are lost because they're not comfortable with you not being a couple anymore. And yeah. then they somehow feel that you're no longer um, matching their dynamic and all of a sudden you're not invited. <laughs> um, I do have another question for you before we, before we close. So um, with everything going the way it is, um, do you believe that we can turn this around? Absolutely, but what I would really caution people is develop your capacity for empathy. It's God-given. Yeah. We're born with it, but if you don't develop it, it atrophies like an unused muscle. When you use empathy, all this media barrage that you're hearing every day, you will slow down and you'll find out the facts. Don't listen to all of the name-calling. L- try to find out the truth. People quote statistics all the time that are inaccurate. Seventy percent of Republicans do this. Sixty percent of Democrats do this. And the name calling, that's not the way to be. That's not the American Mm -hmm. way to be. My clients from other countries who come here, Sylvia, they can't believe the way we're acting. They just can't believe it. I can't either. (laughs) I can't either. It's amazing. We have to trade in our preoccupation with achievement and appearance for character and integrity. And if we do that, and that's what empathy brings, because it brings people together in secure and, and safe ways. That's where change occurs. 
And that's where our society can change. We need empathy training everywhere. Police officers, educators, media, yes. news, new reporters, all of us. If we commit to that, we make a difference one person at a time. That is just beautiful. I love that. I mean, we really do need to have character and integrity and empathy and and not abdicate responsibility to someone else to fix it. It really is an inside job that we're all responsible for. Every single one of us is responsible for it. You know, we can't just point fingers over there at one politician or the other politician and um, and it, it's not about that anymore, folks. We really do have to start taking responsibility and and healing our own stories that are keeping us locked in these prejudices and our conditioned condition mindsets yes i agree wow so this has been just absolutely wonderful again i'm going to remind everyone the name of the book is the stress solution using empathy and cognitive behavioral therapy to reduce anxiety and develop resilience by dr author p uh sarah mccauley your name is the same name as my father's his name was arthur as well what i also love about this book yeah (laughs) what i also love about the book are um all the tools that you provide within it i mean there's great assessment tools there's a stress questionnaire an empathy quotia questionnaire performance addiction questionnaire how to reinforce new beliefs process and false core belief exercise as well as so much more dr arthur uh sir mccauley thank you so much for being on the show you've been an absolute delight thank you sylvia you 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 as well you've asked, you asked excellent questions and I, and I know you have a huge heart i can tell thank you I oh thank it. you so much <laughs> and goodbye everyone until next week i'll talk to you then take care love to you